Yes, hello once again and another warm welcome back to Classic Dirt Bike uh, TV and just before we get down to our next uh, featured uh, machine uh, just a quick heads up as to uh, some of the bikes that are coming up uh, here on my channel in the next uh, few weeks and months now just recently we made uh, an 800 mile round trip uh, to film uh, more classic bikes uh, from the Terry Pickering uh, classic motorcycle uh, collection Terry has uh, one of the nicest uh, collection of old dirt bikes in the country so uh, we spent uh, two days at Terry's uh, lovely uh, museum of old dirt bikes and uh, we filmed uh, a lot more nice classics for you to take a look at uh, here on CDB uh, TV but those will be uh, coming up in of course the next few weeks and months so if you've not already subscribed to Classic Dirt Bike TV and I do hope uh, you will do that very small thing or at the very least uh, return uh, to take a look at uh, those bikes. So right now we're going to uh, feature a bike that uh, is from the early uh, 1970s and uh, when this bike uh, was touted and released in that year uh, this uh, was uh, said to be the nearest that you could ever get to a works bike of its day but of course <laughs> the reality was it's somewhat different when you put the bike on the track so let's get down to business and take a look at Ed Willett's lovely 1972 TM400 Cyclone Right so as I said this featured video that we're going to take a look at is one of the more revered and highly controversial bikes from early 1970s that uh, not only it was substantially cheaper than many of the European bikes that were around at that time it was also touted as the latest uh, rocket ship uh, from Suzuki and as close as you could ever get to uh, a works bike uh, of that year so uh, the machine in question is of course uh, this mighty uh, Suzuki TM400 uh, Cyclone and this example here is from 1972 and uh, this is the property of Ed Willett and uh, Ed had this uh, nice example here on display at the 2024 Telford uh, Classic Dirt Bike Show. Now as you know the original uh, TM400 Cyclone from uh, 1971 would have had this uh, orangey red uh, fuel tank and a uh, orange coloured uh, front and rear mudguards uh, as seen here in one of the sales brochures uh, of its time because uh, Suzuki then uh, changed the colour scheme uh, of this bike just a year later to this uh, much more familiar uh, Suzuki yellow uh, they say uh, to make it uh, more appealing uh, to the riders when they uh, brought out this uh, follow-up model in 1972 but basically uh, Suzuki introduced this TM400 as a bike that would uh, take on the might of the European machines of the likes of uh, Michael Husqvarna and uh, CZ who were of course uh, the dominant force in world motocross at the beginning uh, of the 1970s. But without doubt these uh, cyclones uh, did look like a budget racer's dream because uh, these machines were several hundred dollars cheaper than uh, similar bikes of its size in that year and on the face of it uh, I have to say the bike did have quite good looks and a list of specifications that would be well at home on one of the company's factory bikes let alone one of these lesser uh, production models although the fanfare of all of these goodies then it soon paled into insignificance at the moment that you slung your leg uh, over the bike so exactly just uh, what was it about the tm400 cyclone that didn't measure up uh, to the specifications that were listed in the glossy uh, brochures uh, of that time that also uh, mentioned that this bike here it was for experts only and your average weekend clubman rider need not apply. Well, first of all, despite its compact looks, the old TM weighed in at the time a whopping 247 pounds ready to ride. So for a bike in this class and size, it would still vastly 
uh, overweight. And believe it or not, it was uh, 30 pounds heavier than any other bike in its class at that time. And it was also a mind-blowing uh, 70 pounds heavier than uh, the Coster's uh, works bike, which they say this machine was supposed to be uh, based upon. But uh, then again, that's no surprise when you consider that Coster's uh, works Suzuki uh, used chrome molly steel for its frame, whereas uh, these production bikes used uh, much cheaper uh, mild steel to form uh, the frame tubes, which uh, also meant that these uh, production frames uh, were super heavy and uh, they also flexed as if they were uh, made of uh, rubber. So if you did actually have the opportunity to ride one of these bucking Broncos, then it was probably best to keep any airtime to the minimum uh, while negotiating uh, any kind of jumps or tabletops. Now, not only uh, was the frame uh, too heavy and too soft to be of any practical use on this off-road bike, the other factor of the Cyclone was that this uh, 400cc two-stroke engine was just far too fast and far too heavy for the frame that it was sitting uh, inside. Now, this uh, Suzuki engine, despite it not having any kind of uh, fancy dancy things like uh, reed valves or other uh, devices to improve its performance. This engine uh, wasn't only blindingly quick, its power delivery uh, was up there in the realms of Star Trek warp factor speed. And although uh, the engine was quite manageable uh, low down, uh, when this motor hit that mid range, it just turned it into a high speed uh, roller coaster. And if you weren't ready for the explosion of the power, then you'd certainly need a fresh pair of underwear by the time uh, you slowed it down. Now, according to some of the bike testers of the day, this uh, 400 two-stroke uh, engine was said to pump out around the 40 horsepower mark, which uh, for a 400cc off-road racer in the 1970s was still uh, a bold uh, statement. But uh, if you were lucky enough to experience uh, this engine's power, then you certainly got that impression that it was more or less uh, every bit that it said uh, on the tin. And even experts on these uh, 400s uh, said that uh, the fiery explosion of power was down to uh, a few select uh, components, which uh, firstly consisted uh, of a very light flywheel that didn't exactly help when it came to getting the engine fired up because uh, this power plant here had quite a high compression for a motor of its size and she was certainly a bit of a bitch to get it running and uh, dreaded kickbacks were uh, of course a common occurrence on these uh, cyclones so uh, for kicking it into life it was uh, certainly a case of swapping your soft light sneakers for a much uh, hardier and heavy pair of steel uh, toe cap boots. And of course, the other uh, problem with having uh, a light flywheel on these engines is that uh, it also added uh, to the hard hitting power when the engine uh, got into its mid range uh, sweet spot when it would just take off like the proverbial uh, missile. So, uh, as you can gather, it wasn't uh, like a much more uh, manageable uh, micro open class bike with a, a heavier flywheel that delivered a nice smooth spread of power right through its rev range. This uh, motor here was without doubt uh, very scary and uh, some riders even lived uh, to tell that tale. And to compound this engine's uh, quite bad starting and uncontrollable uh, mid-range power uh, was Suzuki's uh, newfangled uh, PEI, Electronic Ignition System, which Suzuki it was promoting as uh, their latest outer limits uh, high tech with uh, no need any longer for those old school uh, contact breakers that needed constant cleaning and adjustment. This brand new system was completely uh, maintenance free, but at times uh, this new PEI ignition system did occasionally even refuse to deliver a spark, which of course compounded that already uh, bad starting complaint.
So basically, this uh, PEI ignition system on our Cyclone was uh, a bit of a pig, and uh, Suzuki uh, didn't exactly help matters uh, the way that they set it up, because uh, when they discovered that the motor was so difficult to get going, they then uh, set the ignition to full retard to make it uh, easier uh, to start, and then, of course, advanced it uh, when the engine uh, was running, which, uh, under normal circumstances, uh, you would program it to be quite a gradual uh, process uh, as the engine speeds up. But uh, on our Suzuki, uh, that uh, full retard then went into full advance mode at around 4,000 RPM, and then the TM400 just took off uh, like a rocket heading uh, out of the atmosphere. But the power delivery was either all or nothing, and it was very uh, unpredictable. But as we take a look at the TM's front suspension department, where unfortunately things weren't really much better, and to be fair, many of the Japanese off-roaders in the early 1970s did suffer from dodgy suspensions because most of those bikes were really just suspensions that were taken from their road-going counterparts and then used for competition use, which of course... It made them uh, totally unsuitable uh, because most of the internals and the springs on those uh, suspension units were uh, softer uh, than a jelly and there was uh, virtually uh, no damping uh, whatsoever, which uh, on a bike as quick as this was uh, certainly a recipe uh, for disaster. But besides, uh, the European manufacturers of that time uh, were all making uh, much better suspension systems, but uh, in the years to follow, it wouldn't be uh, too long before Japan would then uh, get their act together and design and build much better suspension systems for their uh, motocross uh, machines. And again, here at the back end of our 400 Cyclone, things uh, weren't really a lot better because uh, those original shocks that Suzuki uh, bolted onto the TM in that year were about as basic as you could imagine and uh, those uh, shocks would even struggle uh, to be of any practical use uh, even on a small light road bike uh, let alone uh, a 40 horsepower scrambler with uh, a rubber chassis and of course a power plant that had a light switch uh, power band. But they do say that uh, just even accelerating the TM uh, soon had that rear end uh, bouncing and hopping all over the joint. So uh, bumps, jumps or tabletops and other uh, obstacles were best uh, to be avoided. Now, just to be clear here, we never uh, set out to make this uh, video an assassination of Ed's uh, lovely example of a TM400, although... If you do research uh, this model's history, it's actually uh, very hard to, to find anybody who had uh, a kind word to say about its sum of parts and its uh, performance. And you can see that uh, Ed's bike here isn't a fully original example from 1972 because it has had uh, one or two uh, components uh, swapped uh, since then, although uh, I was never actually it told on the day, but uh, I expect that Ed uh, doesn't race this bike and uh, only keeps it uh, as a showpiece or uh, a talking point when it's on display at these uh, kind of motorcycle shows. But you can see here that back in the 1970s, these old uh, racers still had these underslung exhaust uh, systems, which uh, was another item that uh, reduced the ground clearance uh, on these bikes. So I can imagine that uh, if you were racing this bike in uh, deep, rutted, uh, muddy conditions, then uh, this exhaust system would almost certainly suffer uh, major damage. But uh, many of the other 70s uh, motocrossers of that period, including uh, Michaels, etc., uh, all had this uh, low-lying exhaust uh, configuration. And you can see that this pipe here that's fitted uh, onto Ed's uh, TM is a replacement uh, Gemco uh, reproduction 
item because, uh, as I said, due to uh, the low proximity of this pipe to the ground, very few of those original pipes uh, did survive and uh, they either had to be uh, repaired on a regular basis or just simply swapped uh, for a new or pattern uh, replacement. Now, stopping the 72 uh, Cyclone Suzuki was uh, a bit of a hit and miss affair and uh, these uh, brakes that were bolted onto the front and rear wheels were uh, much the same old uh, drum and shoe systems that Suzuki uh, were using on the road-going uh, motorcycles. But uh, with a bit of forward planning, it was uh, still possible uh, to get your uh, ballistic Suzuki to eventually uh, come to a halt, although... Uh, emergency stops uh, were, were without doubt uh, off the menu because uh, these uh, were as good as it got for the early 1970s and uh, those uh, much more powerful and uh, better engineered disc and hydraulic uh, brakes uh, were still a good few years down uh, the line. So uh, this is really uh, what you had to work with uh, for that period. But there was one thing I forgot to mention while I was uh, working around uh, the TM's engine department uh, was that uh, this 400 motor, of course, had Suzuki's CCI oil uh, lubrication system or uh, crankcase cylinder injection, if you want to give it its full uh, title. But basically, it was just a gear-driven uh, oil pump that was uh, driven from the bike's crankshaft with uh, a separate uh, plastic oil tank normally situated here behind this right-hand side uh, number plate, which of course then uh, fed the two-stroke oil uh, onto the pump where it was then distributed around uh, all of the important parts of the engine's uh, internals. But it was quite common for riders to remove uh, the oil pump and the feeder tank and then just uh, blank off the pump and then just uh, mix the oil and the gas uh, by hand and then just simply add it uh, to the fuel tank in the conventional uh, way. But uh, as I remember, I think the CCI lubrication system uh, still worked uh, reasonably well. And uh, as far as our TM400's controls are concerned, uh, as you can see, all of the stock original Suzuki parts are now uh, long gone, which is no surprise whatsoever after 52 years uh, on the planet, but uh, those 1972 parts have simply uh, been replaced by much more modern uh, components like uh, these rental bars and replacement uh, levers, uh, grips and uh, cables. But uh, I did notice that uh, Ed's uh, also uh, fitted an engine uh, kill switch uh, to, the, to the TM, which uh, for me is an absolute must-have on this bike because if that 400 cyclone motor decides to go ballistic as it often did then at least you can kill the sparks and switch off the engine and it coast to a halt but with regards to the bike's handlebars back in 1972 that crossbar would have been welded onto those bars and not secured with clamps as it is on these modern day uh, rentals. So when it came to the fuel tank on our TM400, uh, now as I remember, I think this uh, Aspen yellow uh, fuel tank was still uh, made of steel back in 1972 and I think it just held uh, over two gallons of regular uh, gas because as I just mentioned, uh, the two-stroke oil was stored in a separate tank which held, I think it was just over a pint of uh, lubrication, so there was no need uh, to measure that gas and oil separately and then pour it into uh, this uh, tank. But usually this fuel cell here held uh, more than enough gas to keep the TM engine happy when it was swallowing uh, up uh, that juice. But uh, back in 1971, uh, this uh, fuel tank here would have been coloured uh, strip orange but uh, of course was then changed uh, to this aspen yellow for the 1972 model and uh, also uh, when it came to comfort 
uh, for your backside. This uh, rather skinny looking seat didn't exactly uh, help matters when you needed uh, a brief respite uh, from the back of the bike bouncing uh, all over the track because uh, as I mentioned uh, the chassis on this bike did uh, do a bit of flexing and uh, those uh, road bike shocks uh, were really uh, only good enough to support uh, the back end of the bike while it was sitting uh, on uh, the showroom floor. So uh, from a rider's uh, perspective, uh, when you had uh, all of those other uh, handling issues going on, I suppose uh, seating uh, comfort uh, was well down the list of racing priorities. Now, surprisingly for 1972, Suzuki uh, were uh, fitting polyurethane plastic fenders uh, to these bikes in that year, while uh, I'm sure that uh, many of the other European uh, bike manufacturers of that decade were still uh, using things like fiberglass or even alloy mudguards uh, on their uh, machines. So at least uh, the controversial cyclone it did have something uh, good uh, going for it because these plastic mudders uh, were certainly light and uh, very durable. So the original 1971 Cyclone with its uh, strip orange and black uh, livery did uh, initially sell uh, quite well because Suzuki uh, were advertising it as as near as you'll ever get to a works bike uh, of its time, although uh, that was of course until riders uh, tried the bike uh, on the track for the first time and then uh, scared themselves uh, shitless uh, with the engine's uh, uncontrollable mid-range power and that chassis uh, evil handling, which uh, then uh, led to a huge demand for aftermarket parts to try and uh, fix uh, the Cyclone's uh, idiosyncrasies. So, uh, at that time, you could then buy things like uh, different ignition systems and uh, modified flywheels and other parts like uh, rear shocks. And uh, even aftermarket chassis uh, were being sold in an effort to try and uh, tame these uh, unpredictable uh, beasts. But uh, of course, by the time you'd done all that, uh, then you could easily have bought this TM uh, three times over and uh, even more surprising, uh, Suzuki continued to promote and sell this bike uh, up until it was then replaced by uh, the much better uh, RM370 in uh, 1975. And despite uh, Suzuki trying to correct the bike's uh, fiery motor and uh, dodgy frame and handling, it would still uh, remain uh, one of the company's iconic models in the range. But unfortunately, for all of the wrong reasons. So despite uh, all of those uh, misgivings and uh, bad publicity that these uh, TMs uh, suffered uh, in that decade, these were uh, still iconic uh, pieces of off-road history because there was no question that the TM was fast enough. It's just that that uh, 40 odd horsepower that the Suzuki engine it was reputed to put out was uh, almost uh, uncontrollable and couple that with its dodgy chassis and uh, road bike suspension and then that made this uh, an extremely tough old bike uh, to tame. So nevertheless uh, this is still uh, a cracking example of one of these old cyclones from 1972 and although uh, I never actually uh, had a conversation with the bike's owner on the day that I took these video clips and pictures. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm assuming that Ed uh, doesn't uh, actually ride uh, the bike uh, on the racetrack, possibly uh, because of uh, all of the factors that we've already uh, discussed in this video. But for me, it was still great uh, to take a look at one of these old uh, classics uh, once again, even although Ed's example here is not a fully original bike from 1972. But that's the beauty of attending this Telford Classic Dirt Bike Show each year because just when you think you've seen everything that there is to see right around the next corner, rare gems such as Ed Willett's at Suzuki then take you straight back to those heady days of the great 1970s when bikes such as this were the staple diet of riders 
uh, across the globe. Okay, so coming up next, we're uh, going to feature the first of the bikes that uh, I recently filmed uh, from the Terry Pickering motorcycle collection. And uh, this bike here is a super rare uh, 1982 440 AJS uh, prototype. And this is one of only two bikes that were ever made uh, by AJS. So you'll uh, get the full story on this machine when we all return uh, to my channel. But for the time being, thanks uh, once again for watching. So until next time, it's goodbye for now. <laughs>